It's almost eight o'clock, 10 seconds. Let's see. I'm gonna start my way. Three, two, one. What's up, y'all? We in the building, eight o'clock, Tuesday, Eastern Standard Time. Where they do that at? Where they do that at? What's good? Green Lion Entertainment, what's good? Hype Style, DJ Kenny Parker, salute. Looking forward to when this gets started today. Peace, the New Yorker. I seen NYC Oil has some words for you, KP, in response to the UMC thing. Yeah, he gave his opinion. Enough respect. I'm moving on. Um, Gregory Nettis, welcome back. 1996, Fox from MOP. That's my girl. Shout out to Fox. Shout out to the whole MOP crew. Came to my high school here in Queens, New York. She was outside and she gave students free posters, CDs, and tapes for MOP album, Firing Squad. She's cool. Word up, son. She's super cool. Incredible person. Shout out to Fox. Nicholas Gilmore, Washington, D.C. is here. Shout out to D.C., what up, BDP Massive? Hold tight. Yes, sir. Fluffy Toenails, what's good? Tuesday just got much better. Peace, DJ Kenny Parker and the KP fan. Much respect, much respect, Fluffy Toenails. It's always a party when you are here. Um, let's see where we're at. Let's see where we're at. Ah. JT, peace family, UK in the building. Tie as hell. Yes, shout out to the UK. That's you know that's one of my favorite spots. You tired? What time is it in the UK right now? Like, like two in the morning. H Bippy, what's good? H Bippy, party started. Welcome back, Rod Woodman. Greetings from Toronto. Greetings from Toronto, Canada. What is the time? Whenever I think of Canada, I just think of cold. It's a beautiful Toronto. Is a beautiful city. The hip hop is dope, food is good, but it's too cold out there, man. A Steel finally made a live, sound good, looks good. Thank you, A Steel. Thank you for finally catching up. Mix M, mix, mix Amy, mix M T T. Well, I'm mess. I'm sorry to butcher that. <laughs> um, peace, Kenny. Sorry. Let the hip hop stories begin. Yes, Kassan Dejula. Peace. Green Lion Entertainment, JT, Peace H. Bippy. Yes, shout out to H. Bippy. It's one of my favorite people we never met, though. Terrell McMillan, KP, what's good? Let's go, bro. Let's go. Um, Curtis Fabian, shout out from the Philippines. North Philly is in the building. Shout out to Philippines and North Philly. Shadow World, L Ch 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 Chatter World, LLC. Peace, Kenny. Peace to the whole chat word. We do this every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Avery Hyman, love and respect KP. Harrisburg, PA in here. Shout out to Harrisburg. I once DJed out there. MODX Mike, welcome back, family. Yo, KP, what up? Not going to place a super chat just to get, to get a shout out. I'm in the building. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your contributions. And here's a super shout out to MODX Mike. But you're always in the building, though. Roz Mel, always in the building. What's happening, Kenny? Don, Mariz Don Marizuti, peace from Scartown, T.O., Canada. Yes. JT, Red Cup Crew. Red Cup Crew, let me sip my water. People be getting on me about sipping water. It, what's wrong with sipping water? <laughs> it's funny. I got a lot of comments about Brussels sprouts. Since I said I didn't like Brussels sprouts last week, this it's like 90-10 in favor of Brussels sprouts overall in the comments section. Who knew? <clears throat> I think there's something wrong with all 90% of you. Um, Ruben Garcia, what up, Kenny? Shout out from Rockland County and why? Shout out to Rockland County. Corey Flood, welcome back. Um, I forgot about Break the Chain. Never could find that comic book. Yeah, I remember Break the Chain, a comic book that KRS did in 1994. And I had the 12-inch vinyl. I don't think I ever had the comic book, but I had the 12-inch vinyl. I might have one left somewhere. Nature, nature, what's good? Peace. Elevation Allah. Why wasn't Miss Melody pushed as a rapper or a singer? Well, she was on Jive Records. Um, you know, back in those days, <clears throat> he probably had like one single, maybe two. 
And if it doesn't pop off, um, the company wasn't behind you. And back in those days, I do believe I've heard KRS mention that when he signed to Jive, when Boogie Down Productions signed to Jive, they signed three deals. Boogie Down Productions, which is basically Karis One, D Nice to a solo project, and Miss Melody to a solo project. So in order for Jive to get KRS, they had to also get D Nice and Miss Melody. Now D Nice went on to have a number one rap song and did a lot of great production. So that worked out. The Miss Melody album, I don't know what the sales were, but she never got a second go either. So I guess they dropped her after the first album. Rest in peace, Miss Melody. Jamel Live. What's up, Car what What's up? Is KRS and KRS One going to release his unreleased music? I don't know. KRS has tons of dat tapes going back to the early 90s of unreleased music. Um, I don't know. You know, the thing about Chris is that he's always forward thinking. He's not very um, what's the word? Um I want to say he, he doesn't reminisce. He's not nostalgic. <clears throat> He's not nostalgic at all. Once he does something, it's on to the next thing. He doesn't think about the past that much. I'm very nostalgic, as you can see on this channel. Um, what did I do here? I'm going to go right here. A Kingdom Serving King. Salute Kenny Parker from New Haven, Connecticut. Shout out Connecticut. I always say this whenever somebody says Connecticut. We did a show in some part of Connecticut. I don't know where we were in the, in the, in the mid-90s. But it was so hood. And we did a show out there. And we was on stage 10 minutes maybe 15 minutes and the crowd went so crazy that they rushed the stage and they had to snatch everybody off the stage and we never even finished the show. I was the only one that didn't get snatched off the of stage because I was behind the turntables. I had my equipment, I had SP-1200, I had everything with me, but the security took KRS and everyone else to the back and a mob just rushed on stage. I remember we threw one, I'm still number one. And the beat dropped. Da -na 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 -na. The crowd just rushed the stage and started dancing on stage and jumping up and down. And security like stopped the show. But I was still up there by myself. So there's some part of Connecticut that is super hood. I don't know what part, but whoa. Elevation a lot. I love Brussels sprouts. Oh, oh. Controversial. What up? What welcome back, controversial. Um Corey Flood. Miss Melody was a whack rapper, and you know that. Uh, I don't think Miss Melody was a whack rapper. I don't believe in whack and dope. I don't believe in that. I Because it, music is too subjective. I mean, what you think is whack, somebody else could think is dope. Matter of fact, a few years ago, maybe like 10 years ago, when YouTube, 15 years, it was something like that, 10, 12, when YouTube first was new. It wasn't new, but it was. It, it's not what it is now. I remember going on um, when they had it used to have the likes and dislikes and you can see the likes and dislikes. I remember going on YouTube and just looking up popular songs to see how many dislikes they had. I looked up Michael Jackson, Billy Jean, one of the most popular songs of all time. It probably had. Let's say. A, 10 million views at that time, and let's say it had like. 100,000 likes and it had like a 1,000 or 2,000 dislikes. In order for a so something to have a dislike, that means somebody went on there, looked at it and said, this is terrible and hit dislike. Like they, they, they were that strong about it. Michael Jackson, Billie Jean had like 2,000 dislikes. So then I went and looked up Bob Marley, Three Little Birds. One of the most classic songs ever. Don't worry about a thing. Another song. Thousands of dislikes. So those people thought that song was whack. Then I went and looked up the Beatles. 
I think it was uh, Let It Be by the Beatles, one of the most standard records ever. Once again, millions of views, hundreds of thousands of likes, but three or 4,000 dislikes on the Beatles, Let It Be. And I say that to say, there's some people that thought those three songs were absolute trash. So I don't believe in whack and dope. Plus, I believe record companies have so much. You guys have no idea how much your record company has to do with whether you'll have a hit record or not. As far as the amount of money they spend, picking the right singles, um, timing. I mean, I, 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 I want to go into a whole thing about that. I'm not going to do it now, but I'm going to go into a whole thing about what really goes into making a hit record? And it's very, it's not what you think. It's not just make a dope record. That is not, that is a small piece of, of what makes an artist big or small. And I say that to say Miss Melody being a whack rapper is relative. Maybe she was whack. Maybe she was dope. Who knows? But she had one single and it was over. I don't know if one single is enough to, to, to give an opinion on anybody. D, D, D size, D size. Congrats on the show name change. Yeah, I just switched it to the DJ Kenny Parker show because a lot of people were on here saying that I should switch it. Um, so I switched to the DJ. I was gonna, you know, I was gonna use the song the Kenny Parker show, but a lot of people, not not us that come on every week, but outside people don't know like Kenny Parker. Who's that? Are you related to KRS? Who are you? So I wanted to put DJ Kenny Parkers to separate myself because there's some other Kenny Parkers on YouTube as well. So DJ Kenny Parker just separates. So I put the DJ Kenny Parker show. I'm going to leave it for a while and see if you guys like it. Um, it's not really my personality to be like the Kenny Parker show. Even that song, I did a breakdown of the Kenny Parker show on this channel. You guys should check it out. I did it like about eight months ago. And it's funny how the, even the title of that song came about. Um, the Colonel James, what's up? KP, just pump, don't believe the hype. What a perfect segue into our weekly chat. Yes, don't believe the hype. Public Enemy, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. Absolutely incredible record. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Paul Major, Major, I have the cassette and the signed comic. How many were pressed? I'm not sure how many were pressed, but you got the cassette and the signed comic. That's big. I'm not sure how many of those are pressed. Um, Blaze, did you participate in the development of the gospel of hip hop? No, I did not. Um, I saw it just like, oh, I didn't see it just like everybody else. I mean, Chris gave me a copy, but um, yeah, I saw it in its completed form. I have a signed copy. <laughs> JT, yo, Kenny, I'm going to get my question answered today. I think you have enough material for a follow-up book at some point. Have you ever thought about it? Um, sheesh, I'm still working on the audio book to the first book, which is very tedious, y'all. It's taking a long time, but it's coming out really dope. But you got to go through every sentence to make sure it's right. Um, I decided that uh, I do have enough material for a second book, but I decided I might just tell you guys, instead of writing it, I might just tell you um, here on YouTube, on the channel, I might just talk about stuff that I would have probably wrote. Um, you know, the book goes into more details on certain things and more like behind the scenes, like the family stuff and like, you know, the real like day to day. That's how the book is structured. But here I just tell you guys, the the uh, the meat of things, but it's so much to talk about, y'all. I feel like um, since I'm on this channel, I, I I I'm gonna turn up this year. I'm gonna turn up the crank a little more on this channel because I want to pump up pump out more content. As soon as I finish the audio book, every day I'm in the studio, um, because there's so much to talk about, y'all. And I and I know I talk about like 1990, 91, 92 a lot. Because just in those two years, there was so much. Like, I didn't even get to, like, 93, 94, 95, 96. Just a ton of stuff. Also, you know, trying to find out what you guys consider interesting. 
you know, might be there might be some things that I think are interesting that you guys might be like, eh, I don't really care. So I try to like get a gauge on what you guys think is interesting. 49 and Neil, what's good? <laughs> Super Bowls in a couple of days, live and direct. Yo, Gregory Netas, Netas, I get your name wrong every week, but let's go. Yo, Kenny, don't drink your juice in the hood while being a menace to South Central and Friday are two of the funniest movies I ever saw. What's your favorite funniest movie ever? Well, first of all, Friday is right up there. Um, I've probably seen Friday 40 times, maybe 50. And every time I see it, it's probably a little piece that I missed. It's always just like little nuggets, little things. If you look closely, you'll see something. Um, funniest movies I ever saw. There's so many, but I'm gonna put. You mentioned Friday for a hood movie. That is that is the the, the standard. The first Friday. Salute, Kenny. MMA Crossfire. Welcome back. Salute, uh, Dan. Was there an album? I don't think there was. Was there an album for Break the Chain? I'm not sure if there was an album, but I know Chris only did one song. Um, Elevation Allah, speak on the Karis One versus Cannabis Beef. Stupid. Um, it was stupid. Some of these things to me, first of all, a few, maybe like two months ago, somebody brought to my attention because I was saying that I don't even know how the cannabis and KRS One beef, which was so short, I don't even know how it started. But somebody said KRS One made a comment that cannabis was lucky to be on LL's song. <laughs> I could see cannabis being upset over that comment. Um, I actually ran into cannabis before that, like maybe a year before that, around the World Trade Center in New York City. Um, obviously, this is before the towers went down. And um, he was mad cool. We exchanged numbers and it was, we were supposed to catch up. It was mad cool. This is what I was talking about, about beefs and how it don't be how you people, not how you people, how you guys, how you guys think it is. I saw cannabis, mad cool, nothing but love. And like a year later, he comes out with a diss record against KRS-One. I mean, even though he, he, can, he can like me and not like KRS-One, that's fine. And if you don't like Harris one that's fine. That's your prerogative. Um, but I remember when the record came out, it it's almost seemed like out of left field. I remember Chris saying, um, should I respond to this or not? I remember him saying that. And I was, and I remember uh I was saying to him, you shouldn't even respond to it because in like another week, nobody's even gonna remember this. And then he said, I'm going to monitor this. That's what he said. I'm going to monitor this. And, and then like a couple of weeks, it was over. But, you know, Cannabis said his piece. Now, I have no problems with people saying their piece. If you have a problem with somebody, say your piece. Um, obviously, I'm going to be on roll with KRS. Um, but if I think Chris is wrong, I will say I think Chris is wrong. I don't know how that beef started, but um, you know, if it pops off, of course I'm gonna be with my brother, but um respect to cannabis. When I met him, he was mad cool. He made a record. In a couple of weeks, it was over. So I don't even know what happened with that, tell you the truth. But like I said, when you see people in the street, it don't be the same as as um after when they be making records, which reminds me. I wanted to say this. Last week we were talking. Last week we were talking about the history of beefs, and I, I was saying the bridge is over is the first real battle record that set the stage. I think we were talking about it two weeks ago, and then I was saying I always was under the impression that the South Bronx was the, really the first time somebody really went at another rapper in that aggressive tone. I do believe the South Bronx would set the tone and then the bridge is over the battle. But um, somebody brought to my attention that Beat Biter by MC Shan going at LL Cool J, which came out a few months before South Bronx, was actually 
MC Shan said LL's name. And I, I said in the comments section, I was saying that I remember Beat Biter, but I kind of remember being subliminal. Like you knew he was talking about LL, but I don't remember him saying LL. But a guy named New New Nuberian, Nuberian, I don't want to get his name right. New Nuberian brought to my attention that Shan did say LL's name in the beginning of the record. He says, this goes out to LL Cool J. Then he proceeds to do a whole record about how LL stole his beat. But if you didn't hear the very first sentence when he says, this goes out to LL Cool J, the rest of it sounds like a subliminal. So I didn't remember that first part, but I will give a shout out to Shan for probably being the first person to really go at another rapper. Which, which I always found odd because if you listen to Beat Biter, when you guys get a chance, listen to Beat Biter by MC Shan and listen to how he's going to LL. But then when KRS came with the South Bronx, which was only a few months later, Shan didn't really respond. He came with like a half-hearted response. And then when the bridge is over, dropped, he just didn't say anything. It just ended him. And I, was, I always wondered why Shan didn't really go at KRS-One the way I think he should have as a hip-hop fan. And listening to Beat Biter and listening to him go at LL, he had it in him. And also, KRS-One was very aware that Shan went at LL because if we listen to South Bronx, he said, instead of trying to take out LL, you need to take your homeboy off the crap. So... Chris was very aware of the song Beat Biter. So he was aware of MC Shan, like MC Shan had it in him. But I don't know, Shan, I don't know. He lost the fire? I, that always has always bothered me how Chris and Shan could have been friends back in the day. Because they were friends. I mentioned it in my book. They were friends back in the day when the bridge is over was out. How? I would love to ask Shan that question. Shan, he, when I see Shan speak, it's like his his opinions change like from, from week to week. So it's kind of hard to lock him down into one thing. But um, I don't know. I just wanted to say that because uh, I like when people fact check me. If I say something that is not accurate, we're about trying to spread truth and knowledge on this channel. So if something I say is not accurate, let's talk about it. Let's fact check. Somebody fact check me on Beat Biter which came out a few months before the South Bronx. Hype Stop, Melody's album was solid, but whoever has a copy has gold. Super rare. It should be re-released. Uh, the album is rare. Do I still have a copy of that? I think I have a copy of that. My vinyl collection got all, over the years, records got broken and just, I think I still have a copy of that. And I'm in that video. Check out Miss Melody live on stage. There's a little piece where the BDP crew sticks their head in. I had just joined BDP at that point. I'm in that video. Um, Danielle Purcell, what do you think about Christian rappers like Lecrae and Andy Manero? I haven't really, I'm not really familiar with their music. I haven't really listened to it, so I don't want to give a, a comment. JT, Just Ice. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I got to talk to my boy, Just. I got to get him on here. Uh, Young Tone, Young Tone, Zero Zero. Peace, Kenny. Are you in contact with Mad Lion and Jamal Ski nowadays? I saw Mad Lion this summer. And we exchanged numbers. I got a call. I saw him this summer at the, uh, the block party that KRS-One had at 1600 Sedgwick. And I saw him at the Versus. Jamal Ski I haven't seen in a while. He's on Facebook, though. We're Facebook friends. Um, shout out to both of those dudes. Um, I always wanted to produce Jamal Ski. We never, we never got to, to work together. Terrell McMillan, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, Terrell McMillan, actually, Shan stated, I pioneered this. He was going at Karis and the Juice Crew Law. Yeah, but nah, you're right. He he had little insinuations on his album, but after the bridge is over, no, forget after South Bronx, Shan's response to the South Bronx was kill that noise. 
which I feel was subpar based on how hard South Bronx was going at him. And now listening to Beat Biter, how hard he went at LL, you should have kept that same energy and went at KRS. Then after the bridge is over, it, it, it's hands after that. <laughs> it's hands after the bridge is over. So, I mean, I helped pioneer this. I actually like that song, by the way. But it was vague. It's vague. It was vague. Shan had ample time to to, to go at KRS, man. He he, he should have went at him, man. He really should have went at him. I don't I I don't understand it. It's one of the biggest mysteries to me, because I liked MC Shan. I I don't understand. I mean, the Bridge Is Over was a once in a lifetime unbelievable record that started a whole genre in hip hop. It's, like I said, it's one of those songs. And KRS One was one of those artists that we didn't know at the time, but he was coming. But still, I don't think Shan put up a proper fight. And I don't know if I remember talking to Biz. Shout out to my boy Biz Mark. He was my picture of Biz. All right, there, y'all can't really see it. Me and Biz. I miss you, Biz. Um, I was talking to Biz one time and I asked him. What did y'all think when y'all heard the bridge is over, like in the Juice Crew? And Biz told me Shan and Marley and was saying that the bridge is over was whack. And Biz said he was going, nah. <laughs> you know how Biz talk. Nah, that's not whack. But Shan thought, that's Biz says, says Shan thought, um, the bridge is over was whack. And there's another thing about Shan. I'm not, mean, not meaning to pile on Shan, but I, oh, I've seen a few articles that MC Shan was in the studio and helped mix Eric B's and, and Rock Kim's first single, Eric B for President and Check Out My Melody. And they said when they first heard Rock Kim doing Check Out My Melody, Shan went out in the hallway and was laughing. Like he thought this was horrible. Which the first time I heard Check Out My Melody, I almost passed out. <laughs> um, so Shan heard Check Out My Melody and The Bridge Is Over and thought both of those songs was whack in, in 87, 86, 87. So it just goes to show where his head was at at the time. He, I don't know if he was connected right to, to what was going on because you heard Rakim and KRS and you thought both of those songs were whack. Two songs that changed the game. I don't know. All right, that's my rant, y'all. Sorry. Let me get back to this. Um, didn't Roxanne, we talked, did, um, Mario, um, didn't Roxanne Charte and Real Roxanne have songs against each other? I may, may remember this wrong. There was like 25 responses to, 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 to UF, UTFO. After a while, this became a jumbled mess. I remember the, the girls were more like answer records. So and Pepper answered Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick. Shantae answered UTFO. But I don't remember Shantae and Roxanne battling on wax like back and forth. It still it, it was vague. It didn't it didn't start the trend. The bridge is over is what after the bridge is over, that's when the trend started. Muck Muck the General, the two best MCs ever, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I would concur. Especially of that era, for sure. Controversial. Shan was on the pipe at that time. I don't want, I mean, I, I've heard him, I don't want to put that out on him. I've heard him say he had drug abuse problems around that time. Um, that may have contributed. Um that may have contributed, but uh, I mean, he was coherent enough to make his album. He made some dope songs on his album. I mean, he was, I mean, like I said, I helped pioneer this was dope and Down By Law was dope. The song with MC Shan that he had the video, not MC Shan, MC Shan song with TJ Swan, um, Left Me Lonely. Like he was coherent enough to make songs that were good, but he couldn't hear Rock Him and KRS. I don't, and Kane was like, Shan was treating him a um, little standoffish. 
So he didn't really embrace Kane either. He didn't embrace Kane. He thought Rakim and KRS were whack. <laughs> That's Ooh. Ice cold beverage. JT KP said he might get KRS on the stream soon. Can't wait. Yeah, but Chris is all over the place touring, so I'm gonna have to lock him down. But I, I spoke to him about it a few weeks ago. Um I scroll, let me go back a little bit. Yes, Mario, yes, Shantae got dissed by the real Roxanne. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that. I'm sure there was probably a record later on. They would I don't know. There was a million of those records. Um and PC to be it's no different, male or female. Okay, you gotta protect your brother's brand, but he no, I'm not protecting the brand. There's no different male or female. I just don't, there was no, I don't remember ba the battle. When I talk about starting a trend, we talked about this two weeks ago. There's certain records that when they dropped, it changed the rap game from this point on. And there might have been people that did something before that, but it didn't change the game. Like, um, Gang gangster rap allegedly. A lot of West Coast artists said that Schooly D PSK influenced them. Just Ice was the the gangster of hip hop in '86. BDP dropped Criminal Minded, which some people think was the first gangster rap album. That was early, and those were good songs. But the trend didn't start till NWA. NWA is when gangster rap really took off. And that's what I mean when I say start to trend. Like the message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was the first conscious record. That was the record that set the mold. And I think it's the greatest record of all time, hip hop record in my opinion, most important record ever. But it didn't start to trend in 82. There were a few records like Problems of the World Today. There were a few records, but that wasn't the trend until 88 when, when PE and BDP came, then that's when the trend started. So I say that to say Shantae might have had a bat, might have made a record, or Roxanne might have responded to Shantae, but that wasn't the battle records, not till Shan versus KRS. That's when the battling on wax really took off. Everything before that was kind of like subliminals, or were they talking about each other? And, you know, you didn't really take it serious like that. That's just my argument. Supreme Divine, MC Shan is a hip hop god, period. I have nothing but respect for Shan. Roxanne versus Sparky D. Remember, they used to battle a lot, they said in person. Fluffy Toenails, has Karis checked out your channel yet? Um, he doesn't really look at. YouTube like that, he did say he saw the uh, PM Dawn one. He said he saw the PM Dawn one. Gog and Fluff. MC Shan has a great voice, but he wasn't as lyrical as KRS. No, he wasn't as lyrical or he didn't have as many concepts, but he still had, he still could have went, like he still could have presented himself. I mean, the poet wasn't as lyrical as KRS either, but he went for his. And he didn't even have nothing to do with the battle. Triggs 9802. Did BDP have any issues going to Queens after the Bridges Over came out? Nah, because BDP used to roll incredibly deep places. I remember going, to, there was a there was a Queens, like a skating rink in Queens. And BDP went out there, I think when South Bronx was out, and went in, in the Queens and did South Bronx. Like, what? In this big skating rink. But I, BDP used to roll. Like, people don't, a lot of people don't, I don't like to really talk about that much on this channel, but BDP was, the BDP crew was massive, man. I mean, you've seen KRS, you see D-Nice, you see Scott LaRock. 
there was a lot of dudes. They used to come in the Latin quarters, Union Square, super deep. So to answer your question, BDP used to go to Queens without really any problems. I've never heard of any. By the time I joined the group in 89, there was no problems. I mean, I used to go to Queens by myself. Um, Seattle Connected Podcast. Why wasn't MC Shan on the symphony? Good question. And why wasn't Rakim on self-destruction? I asked Chris that question last time I saw him, and he said he'll answer it on this channel. Let's give me a second, y'all. I'm I'm a I'm a um get I'm gonna get to it. I'm gonna get to all of this in a minute. D C D C I can't even pronounce it. D C S. Roxanne's grandma reply was my favorite. <laughs> Roxanne's grandma. Yeah, there was like twenty five answers to to U T F O. D J D J I Q S. Roxanne's doctor. <laughs> yeah, it it became just a mess. Um, it became just a mess. YouTube illegally deletes accounts. I disagree. I don't know if you disagree with, but that's okay. I don't know. Maybe that has nothing to do with me. Roxanne's Revenge was the original dissertation record. Mm-hmm. Blaze, you have any Breakbeat Lou history? You know, it's funny. I met Breakbeat Lou about six or seven years ago for the very first time that I know of. And he was very good friends with Scott LaRock back in the day. And Breakbeat Lou is one of those unsung, most influential people in the history of hip hop who nobody really, he's not a household name, but his work with the Ultimate Beats and Breaks shaped the sound of the 80s into the 90s. Triggs, 9802. Roxanne says she approached Karis one at the store after she heard the bridge is over. That is correct. I talk about it in my book. If you guys don't have the book, I'm going to plug it. Pick up the book. My brother's name is Kenny. The link is in the description below. It's the real origin of BDP, the whole backstory of my family, how Karis became Karis. I got some behind the scenes stories, the stuff that I saw in those times, it's crazy. And one of them is being Shantae. And I actually spoke with T- to Shantae about a year ago about um, her encounter with Carrie Rest because they had another, there was another record in between. She, she answered, Kane wrote a record called Have a Nice Day for Shantae responding to BDP. And then Chris had a record that he only did one time at Latin quarters that most people never heard. That was ridiculous. And he never put it out. And me and Shantae was talking about that last year. I'm going to do one. I'm going to do the real Juice Crew BDP breakdown because there's gaps and stuff and people get stuff. There's like little gaps and there's things that happen that's not part of the narrative to me. I'd like to do my version of events because there's a lot of little things that happen that most people don't um, don't talk about. YouTube illegally deletes accounts. <laughs> YouTube illegally d- deletes accounts. That's the name. Um, that's still number one. A remix was ridiculous. Yes, it was. Chris responded to the poet. Ridiculous. I was in the studio when he recorded that. Markeith Bankroll. My brother's name is Kenny. Salute, bro. Salute. Guess, guess who? She said, she said broken down punks. Yeah, BDP stands for broken down punks. All that is Kane. I mean, Kane, Kane. I mean, Kane is elite, man. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Oh. The whole BDP story should be a TV series like Wu Tang. Yes, I agree. Jamil Live, any unreleased albums, KRS One, that we don't know about? Well, Maximum Strength, I believe. There was an album that was supposed to come out. Um, I Got Next dropped in 1997. Towards the end of 98, 
there was a new BDP Karis One album that was supposed to drop called Maximum Strength. Now he dropped the Maximum Strength years later. That was the title, but that was not the Maximum Strength that was supposed to come out in 1998. Um, somehow it didn't work out with Jive. After that, Chris left Jive. There was some controversy with Jive and then Chris left the label, so it never came out. But that album was supposed to come out. There was some joints on there too. Um, did I do a song? I did one song. I did a song that ended up being on Sneak Attack. There's a song I did on Sneak Attack and I can't remember the name of it, but the one that was on Maximum Strength had Tragedy Gaddafi, Tragedy from Queensbridge, Tragedy Gaddafi, tra Tragedy from Queensbridge. And KRS, he was on the song with KRS. But the version that came out, I think on Sneak Attack, they took tragedy off. Roz Mel, Shan said the reason that he wasn't on the symphony is because Melly, Melly, Molly Maul owed him money and he didn't want to pay him. That may or may not be true. I don't know. Shan's stories change so much. I wish we could lock Shan in. He has so much history. Can we lock Shan in? What happened, Shan? And lock it in like one story. JC, super dope book. Excellent read, bro. Very compelling and heartfelt. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone who bought the book. I really appreciate it. The book did and is doing really well. And the audio book is coming out incredible. Shante is the ish. Uh, D D D C I I I'm just messing up your name, man. Shante is the ish on Sirius XM. Yes, I did her show la last year. Oh, somebody asked, what is Harmony doing? I just lost their name. I haven't spoken to Harmony in over 30 years. I have no idea. Dan Mar Marasuti, was there a battle at LQ with KRS and versus Melly Mel? I did a whole breakdown on this channel about a year ago. Go on my this channel, go back. To my videos, I have a whole KRS one versus Melly Mel. Fluffy toenails, we need cool, cool, we need cool V on here. Absolutely. Um, that's my dog. Uh, shout out to Cutmaster Cool V, super cool brother. I miss we used to all hang out together, me, him, Biz. I miss I, I miss Biz immensely, y'all. Gary Gordon, what is Cool G rap and KRS relationship? I'd have to let Chris answer that question. BC's got a documentary. Biz got a documentary. BDP KRS should too. I agree, but you know what's unfortunate about those names you mentioned? Someone has to pass away for people to do a documentary about you. That's so whack. You know, you don't, you never really get your flowers until you pass away. That's why, you know, me over the years, and I've been doing this since the 80s. If I see an artist that I like, I walk right up to them and I say, hey, I really like your music. I introduce myself and I say, I really like your music. And I give them their flowers right there. And, you know, for the most part, artists are very appreciative. Thank you so much, whatever. And I've met a lot of people and become good friends with people introducing myself. I mean, every once in a while, I'll meet somebody and I'll do that and they'll brush me off like Jay-Z. I have a whole story about that on this channel. I did about a year and a half ago. Check it out. I walked up on Jay-Z to tell him I liked his music and it didn't go well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, a documentary would be dope, but I hope it's not because somebody passed away. NPC 3PO, finding out a lot of classics were ghost written is kind of heartbreaking. This whole MC thing was that is that was that it was all about you and your imagination. Let me tell you something. That's a good point. And I want to talk about this later, but it's a good point. This whole ghostwriting thing, my opinion is this. That is an unwritten rule that hip hop didn't follow from day one. Rappers delight the record that started it all 
It was one of the biggest frauds you guys know in the history of music that Big Bank Hank was managing the Cold Crush. And when he heard that Sylvia Robinson of Sugar Hill was putting a rap group together to make the first record ever, instead of going to get the Cold Crush, one of the greatest groups ever that he was managing and bring them to Sylvia Robinson, he instead borrowed Grandmaster Kaz's rhyme book and said Kaz's rhymes on the record. Rapper's Delight sold 6 million copies worldwide. It's the biggest selling 12-inch single still of all time. And Big Banks Hank's rhymes are stolen. No disrespect to the dead, but he is a complete fraud. And if you listen to the record, you know, I'm the CA. He going, I'm the CAS and the OVA and the rest is FLY. He said, I'm casting over flight. He said, I'm Cas. I'm six foot one and I'm tons of fun. He's not six foot one. Cas is six foot one. All that hotel, motel, holiday in, everybody knows those rhymes. That's Cas's rhymes. So start there. The foundation of hip hop there is already a problem. Stolen lyrics. And I just found out recently that more of Big Bang Hank's rhymes were stolen in later records. I'm putting it out there. I just, I got this scoop this summer from a very reliable source. And look at um, the message, which I said is the most important record ever made. Another record. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Only one of the Furious Five has written rhymes on that record. If you look at the record, there's a guy called Duke Booty who just passed away, I think, last year. Duke Booty wrote most of the message. Who's Duke Booty? He's not in the Furious Five. Wrote just about every rhyme in that song and... The last verse, the verse that everybody remembers that goes, a child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. That's one of the greatest rhymes ever. Melly Mel said that same rhyme three years earlier in 1979. Y'all look up, I think it's Super Rapping. It's Super Rapping 1 or Super Rapping 2. I can't remember which one. He says those same rhymes, but to a different beat. The beat is mad fast. And he's going, a style is born up to the mind, blind to the ways of man. Come on, he's rhyming that fast. He took the same rhymes from 79. Sylvia Robinson, when they were doing a record, she said, hey, remember those rhymes you said back in 79? That would go real good right now in this record in 1982. And he said the same rhyme again in 82, slower on this song, and it became one of the greatest rhymes ever. You can't be saying the same rhymes twice in a record. I mean, t- back, like taking rhymes for one record, can you? I don't know. I'm not an MC. But even that record, the second foundational record in hip hop was built on ghostwriting. And then you could just go down the list. Um, I'm not going to call anybody else out on here, but so many records, so much ghostwriting. So that's why people get mad and, you know, the purists get mad and be like, oh, Drake had a ghostwriter. I'm like, well, if you're going to be mad at Drake, then we should be mad at all people we love too. There's a lot of people we love too. There's people in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as rappers. There's only a handful of groups. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the biggest honor that a musician can get in music, to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's only a handful of rap groups in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. NWA is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and rightfully so. But out of five members, I think four of them are rappers. And out of the four rappers, Dre and Easy never wrote a rhyme. Four of the two, four, two of the half of the rappers in NWA are not rappers. And they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as rappers. 
Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, as they should be. But like I said, the message, their biggest song is all ghost written. So we're going to get mad at Drake. Let's, we got to get mad at everybody. That's my thing. And even Drake... I don't know if I would call him having a ghostwriter because he gave dude credit. Credit equals publishing. And for you guys that don't know, publishing is how an artist really gets paid. Every time a song is played on a radio or anywhere, you get like, publishing on a single is probably like 25 cents. Let's say, I, I can't remember the exact numbers because it varies. Let's say 25 cents. Every time a record gets played, that goes up into the, for a big hit record, that can go into the millions of dollars. So if somebody gives you publishing credit on a song, that's worth hundreds of thousands, depending. Drake gave this, this guy, supposedly his ghostwriter, credit. I don't consider that a ghostwriter. I consider that a collaborator to me. But, you know, they beat up on Drake. You know, you can have your opinion. I'm not, you know, too uh, for or against. That's cool. But if we're going to beat up on Drake, then we got to beat up on a lot of the people that we love, too. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. And I have like a lot more. I have, you know, I have a million, million stories about ghostwriters. We hear about it all the time. But um, I'm going to leave it at that. But that was a good point about ghostwriters. And it breaks. It does break your heart. Um, To hear that a lot of the songs and a lot of the people that you love didn't write. And I can see if you have like a line here or a line there or somebody came with a hook. No, these are whole songs written by somebody else that never got any credit. Triggs, 9802. Did one get invited to the 50th hip hop Grammy celebration and turned it down? Well, Chris did a whole rant about that. So apparently, yes. Gregory Nettis, yo, Kenny, did you do you remember Nine from the Bronx? What you want, Nine, is a classic. Of course, that's my man. What you want, Nine? Shout out to Nine. That's my dude. And I liked his second single, NEMC. NEMC, a disagree with me. Wave your arm. I was with all that. Shout out to Nine. Um, let me scroll down a little bit because I've been talking. The Colonel James, KP, the part where you describe you and Chris digesting Rapper's Delight as it broke on the radio is a very special piece of historical writing. It must be an amazing, a major change y'all could feel. Yes, he's talking about, uh, I write in the book about me, me and KRS, my brother Chris, first heard Rapper's Delight as kids. And it, it changed, well, it changed Chris's life forever because that from that day on, he decided he wanted to be an MC. Um, yeah, Rapper's Delight blew us away. It blew everybody away. Dan Maserati, Dan Maserati, the fake Drake ain't hip hop. He can't compare. Well, maybe so, but like I said, if, if, he, if, if he ain't hip hop, if we're going to be mad at him, then we got to be mad. I'm just saying, if you're going to be mad, be mad. That's why when I talk about the greatest of all time, like when people make lists and say the greatest of all time and they have their list, for me, the greatest of all time had to write their rhymes. At least most of them. You know, 95% of everything we've ever heard you say came from your pen. To be the greatest ever. Our business too. Special K of the Treacherous Thief wrote T the Rocks, it's yours. Yes, and that's that's his brother. Special K and T the Rock are brothers. I just found that out a few years ago. Amazing. Amazing family. A lot of talent in that family. <coughs> Excuse me. But yes, we love this yours. Classic record. Ghost written. There's so many go. I, I you know, I would go on a limb. I would go. I'm going to argue a, lo a large percentage of records that we love are not what we think it is, man. Seattle Connected Podcast. Have you ever met Pete Rock? Oh, my God. Have I ever met Pete Rock? <laughs> That's my dog. 
Shout out to Pete. He's one of those people that I walked up on and said I liked his stuff. In 1991, uh, Pete Rock and CL Smooth had just came out with their EP called, I think it was All Sold Out, I think it was called. And they were having an album release, like a listening party. That's how new it was. And they had a song. I, I got the, 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 it was an EP. I think it had six songs on it. And I got the song, I got the EP, and they had a song called Mecca and the Soul Brother that I liked. And I went to their party, and I was in the party, and I saw Pete Rock, and I stopped him. And I was like, hey, how you doing? I'm Kenny Parker from BDP. And he's like, I know who you are. And I was like, I really like Mecca and the Soul Brother. That's my shit. And, you know, we we bonded right then um, in 91, and Pete became my dude after that. Ever since, I saw Pete Rock this summer. That's my dude. Shout out to the Chocolate Boy Wonder. Gargan Flood. Tupac and Biggie didn't have ghostwriters as far as I know. They ghost wrote for others, though. Yeah, as far as we know, yeah. I mean, you look at Biggie. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to... <clears throat> I don't want to downgrade anybody on this channel. That's not my, my uh, intent. Because... I also understand the how life changing a hit record could be. And the reason I say that is because Biggie, like you look at like Little Kim, Big wrote a lot, man. First of all, just about every female rapper out had ghostwriters. Like when you ask, when you say who's the greatest female rapper of all time, for me it's hard because it's like most of them wrote, I mean, most of them had guys behind them writing. So how can you say? Some of these guys, some of these guys like Biggie and Jay and Nas, they're so talented that any, just about anybody that says their rhymes could be a star. I saw Little C say that the Junior Mafia songs that he did, um, like, uh, grab your dick, give me love hip hop, those songs. He said, those are Biggie's rhymes that he left on the floor in the studio. Biggie had papers on the floor. They picked them up and, and just set them. And we all loved it. Everybody loved Little Caesar's rhymes. Caesar's not was not an MC. He'll say it. I was not an MC. Big wrote rhymes for me. But C set them and we all loved them. Right now, I've never rhymed a day in my life. If I said Biggie's rhymes on a record, I would probably sound incredibly dope that's how important ghostwriting is some of these people hove and all them nines that wrote for these people even people like these people you're not even thinking about like kooji rap wrote for salt and pepper and things like that incredible these guys are incredible imagine having kooji rap writing for you so i mean I can go I can go on for days about the ghost writing thing because it's really it's a touchy subject because you want to hit record so bad. Let me tell you something. I saw a run 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 of Run DMC made a comment. He said a hit record a real hit record will change your zip code. And I thought about that and I'm like he's right just one, you catch one hot song, it'll change your life, your family's life, put your kids in college, buy houses for your mother, everything, one hit. I know a reggae artist who had one hot 12 inch single. He didn't even have an album out yet. I was chilling with him, went to his crib to because I was potentially going to do a beat for him. This dude was living in New Jersey in a mini mansion. We got to the dude's crib. We had to turn. We turned onto his property and drove for like another two minutes on his property down a, a little road. Got to his house. On one side was the mansion. And on the other side was the horse's stable. There were no horses in there, but he had a horse's stable and a maid's quarters on his property. This dude had one reggae 12 inch, but he was doing that many shows. 
that he was making that much money. And I say all that to say, with that kind of money at stake, people will do anything to get a hit record. And I could understand, like, I need a hit. And if somebody got a song and you know, and you don't have a song and somebody got some hot rhymes, people will take your stuff and say it like it's theirs and become rich and famous. It's just the way it is. So I'm not knocking anybody for having a ghostwriter, but, you know, in the, in the artistic sense of the word, it, it, it's not hip hop. But then again, is it not? Because hip hop, the foundation of hip hop is, is built on ghost written, ghost writers. Tone 210, a battle rap should never be ghost written. <laughs> I agree with that, but yo, it happens. Like I just said, Shantae, have a nice day, was a dope ass record and she went to KRS which I give her much credit because she's the only one that stepped to him. But that was Kane. Somebody wrote, Kane wrote Biz's album. Love Biz. Bug, once you add business interest to the equation or money and it changes the landscape, absolutely. As far as hip hop goes, no one else could be a writer graph without showing and proving. I agree, but how would you know? If you met Big Bank Hank and he started saying hotel, motel, holiday in, that that rhyme back in 1979 would have bodied everybody. Like this guy, Big Bank Hank is incredible. Like we thought he was. We didn't know. How would you know that's Grandmaster Kaz's rhymes unless you heard a Cold Crush mixtape? How would you know that? We don't even know who's a ghost writer and who's not. You, you won't even know. Return of the Brother 2. There are MCs and there are hip-hop performers. The performers take a back seat to me. I agree. But who's an MC? How will you, my argument is how will you know? You have to take somebody's word for it. How would you know? We believe. I believe Kane, Rakim, KRS, Redman, Q, the, the greats, the, to me, the, I, the people that I hold in the highest regards. I believe in them. Tretch. I believe in these people. But how do you know? Because they said so. The harsh truth. Kane wrote Picking Boogers for Biz. Great record. Cool, cool int, int, international. That's why the people that are rappers should never be professional artists unless they can write their own songs or raps. Yeah, but like I said, the money, man, and the business, it's a business. Once you get into the music business, everything is different, man. You might get in the business and a record company might come to you and say, you want a record deal? We have songs, but we need you to say this. Do this song, say these rhymes, and I'll give you a record deal. But no, I got my own rhymes. You want to hear me spit? I don't care about that. Say this, or we'll get somebody else to say it. We got enough money right here to pay your rent for a year. What you gonna do? You gonna you gonna you want to get in the game? You do it. Let me scroll down a little bit. Um, Gargan Fluff. Hey, what's good? Big Pun wrote a lot of rhymes for Fat Joe. Big hits, big records, made a lot of money. Blades, if they're ghost writers, then you have to believe they're ghost producers. You know what? I didn't even want to go there because that's a very sensitive topic for me. I'm going to leave that alone. And you know why? Because I, I will be, we are at an hour, y'all. I could do another hour on that. I think as rampant as you think ghost writing is, ghost producing eclipses ghost writing. The amount of stolen beats 
is astronomical. I've, I could tell you horror stories. I have horror stories. The ghost producer, that's a great blaze. Thanks for bringing that up. I don't even, I, I'm, I'm so sensitive about that. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> maybe I, maybe I, because I, I, I want to do a whole thing on ghost producers and what I want to do, I didn't want to give it away, but it's just us. Some of the producers that I want to bring on here, I want to talk to them about ghost producing because I know they got crazy stories. I have a lot of things I want to do with this channel, y'all. It, it, it's, it's coming. Please, please bear with me. But that's one of the things I want to do. Nobody really talks about that, but it's rampant. A lot of the producers that you think are dope, they are dope, but they're not who they think. They're not who you think they are. Platform Radio. Glad to check in on the live, Brother Kenny. Thank you so much for checking. Thank you, everybody, for checking out, for coming on the channel. For those of you that's going to check out the channel later on in the, in the re replay, thank you so much. Like I say every week, you guys are the backbone of this channel, and I really enjoy doing this on a Tuesday, just kicking it with you guys. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, we do this every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm, we had an hour, y'all. I'm going to try to not go too I've been going really long lately. I'm going to try to not go too too far. MM Crossfire. It's like a news anchor reading the news. They didn't necessarily report on everything they read. Yeah. Basically, yeah. It's like a news anchor. They like news flash and somebody hands them a piece of paper and they're telling it to us and we're hearing it for the first time and we're like, wow, this guy, Walter Cronkite, just broke that John F. Kennedy got shot. And we're like, Walter Cronkite is the guy with all the news. And really, there's a whole team behind him. But the only difference is Walter Cronkite never claimed to be outside. Walter Cronkite never said, I was in the car with John F. Kennedy when he got shot. He never said that. He's just telling you news. Rappers are like, yeah, I was in the car. It's me. I'm telling you what I saw. And they weren't there. That's the difference. Fluffy Toenails, Pete Rock does did it all. Yes. You're right, Kenny. Usually, when I find out someone is a fraud, that material goes into the resale to a resale shop. Yeah, but but don't do it because a lot of great records, a lot of great records are great records we all love are not. You would throw away everything. You would throw away half your collection <laughs> if you if you really knew the truth. You would throw away half your collection, bro. Gregory Nettis, Fearless Four, Problem of the World Today is an underrated classic. Yes, it is. They should have been bigger. But rap back then, you're talking 83, 84? When did that come out? 83? Rap was so small back then. Rap was New York. <laughs> they were big in New York. That record was on the radio in New York. But it was just New York. Rap wasn't big enough for them to be bigger, I think. I mean, if you would say they should have been bigger than say the Treacherous Three, or like Epinet, Epinet Realm, like Treacherous Three, Flash, Furious Five, maybe. Um, but look at their subject matter. Conscious rep music never sells as much as party music or sex or violence. Even then, great record, but it's not gonna do as well as a party record. Let me scroll down a little bit. I just know somebody said I can't see anyone writing for KRS. I can't either because his his ego wouldn't allow it. <laughs> his 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 own grandioso wouldn't allow him to let somebody else write something and he say it. Forty nine and Neil. Does Dr. Dre have ghost producers? Ha ha! I'm a huge Dr. Dre fan, so I I don't even want to go there. <laughs> B Dubs plays. What up, Kenny? What up? Soul Stastic. Soul Stastic Matter. What up, Kenny? What up? Um, Nate thirty two X. You can usually tell who wrote it by the style of rhymes. Sometimes. But if a, a real dope ghostwriter like a Big Daddy Kane, 
How Kane wrote Nobody Beats the Biz. Go listen to Nobody Beats the Biz and listen to Kane and you tell me you think Kane wrote that. That's incredible how he morphed himself into Biz. That's incredible. Or Jay-Z wrote Still Dre on the Chronic Chronic 2001. Jay-Z became a West Coast G talking about low riders and bouncing cars and blades and all that. If, if they didn't tell you, you never would guess that was Hove. Jonathan Kidd, you should do something on Ghost Producers. Oh, believe me, it's coming. Our Justice Hip Hop. I get out of class at 9 p.m. I'm always late. Better late than never, man. I, I love you. Thank you so much for checking in. DJ Reagan, Dr. Dre has ghost producers. Still Dre is a perfect example of ghost of a ghost produced song. And I love that song. I love it too. But look, Scott Storch, you ever see Scott Storch when he's playing on the piano all the songs that he did? And he'll go doom, 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 doom. He'll play Still Dre on the piano, meaning Scott Storch came up with that. Then you put the rhymes with Hove. And it says Dr. Dre on the front. Sold six million copies. That album sold six million. You know how you're different your life would be if you had an album that sold six million copies? Your whole life, your future life, your kids, their kids, their kids' lives would be different if you had an album that sold six million copies in America, six times platinum. All you got to do is get this guy, Scott Storch, and Hove over here, and you say it, and you could be rich forever. Would you do it? Triggs, 902. Enjoy the show, Kenny. Have fun at the Sway in the Morning Super Bowl party Sunday. Yes, I'm doing a Super Bowl party with Heather B and Sway in the morning on Sunday. Um, that should be fun. G off Warhol, sounds like you're out. Thank you for making Tuesdays better, KP. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yes, we're at an hour and 12. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to peace out. I'm just looking at a couple of things. Um, just trying to get a last couple in here. Platform radio. Platform radio. If a sample isn't cleared, how hard is it for a producer to rework the song with a different sample or sound used? Well, if you have access to a dope keyboard player or band or whatever musicians you need, you can probably get it close, but that person can still sue you. If you wanted to use Good Times by Chic and you played it like Sugar Hill Gang did, they brought a band in the studio and they played Good Times over and they still got sued and lost. Chic owns a piece of Rapper's Delight. I mean, that's 1979. I mean, you can even bring it up to, there was no sampling laws then, but you can even bring it up to later on. If you say, if you play somebody's stuff over and it sounds close to what they did, they will still step to you. Mario Arnold, in the 80s, I would have thought you had you have to write your rhymes, but now I understand that to make a hit song, you may have to collaborate with other musicians. Hip hop is, is no different. Yeah. Um, I asked Grandmaster Kaz um, about a year ago. I was had a, the, the honor to talk to Grandmaster Kaz about two summers ago. And I asked him in, in the day, in the, in the 70s, before um, hip hop came on wax, did you guys, did everybody write their rhymes? Or was it understood that you had to write your rhymes? He was like, yes. It was understood that if you heard an MC spit in the 70s on those cassettes, that that was their rhymes. But he said sometimes in the Cold Crush, he would have a routine or he'd have rhymes and everybody wouldn't be ready. And they had like a show to do or something. So he would write and let somebody else say a part because they needed to be ready. And, you know, for time constraints, he would let somebody else say a Kaz rhyme. But he said, overall, back in those days, 
you had to write your rhymes. So I asked him, when did it switch? What went wrong? And he said, the minute they started making records. The minute they started making records is the minute ghostwriting came. Bug, aha, you just kicked the rhyme. Did I? <laughs> this is a whole team behind Dr. Dre, too. Yeah, not saying Dr. Dre, he's produced a lot of records. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying he's not dope. He is absolutely a genius behind those boards. But like you said, there's a whole team behind him. Hip hype style. I wonder who that reggae artist was. Was it Annie Kamosi? Here comes a hot stepper. No. That was a number one smash, by the way. Oh well, kudos, whoever it was. Enjoy your career. Milk it for all it's worth. Yeah. Yeah, you can get one hot single. And that was back in the day. That was I'm talking 90. When it, the story I'm telling you about the reggae artist was in like 94. By today's standards, a hit record, you can make millions, millions of dollars with one song. All right, I'm going to get out of here, y'all. I don't want to hold y'all too long. Uh, I'm just scrolling down. Muck, muck the general. When that Joker MC Search said he wrote something for Rock Kim, I almost lost my mind. Shout out to MC Search. That's the homie. They, some, somehow he was trying to say that Rock Kim had writer's block or something. So he took it upon himself to try to help him along by giving him a rhyme, something like that. Um, giving the guard some rhymes. That's woo. I don't know. All right, I'm gonna get out of here, y'all. I, I, I say that, I keep saying that, but I just keep looking. Rod Wood, I'm gonna do two more mouth. So many producers got held hostage for beats. Damn, it was crazy in the 80s and 90s. Yes, still, but in the 80s and 90s, it was brutal, man, brutal. Cause you wanted to get in the game. It was, it was, it, it's not like now where you could just put stuff on YouTube, put stuff on SoundCloud, put stuff on iTunes or whatever. Back then, you had to get with someone who was in the game. And in order to get in, you had to pay your dues. And paying dues might be like, let me hold something. And then I'll pay you after you establish yourself. But your best stuff might be what you gave to get in. Gave away hits. All right. We out. Um, Divine Supreme. It's obvious that ghost producing is worse than ghost writing. Let's look at all the biters in producing, copying Q-Tip, Premier, Rizzo, and Pete Rock. True, but even copying is not even, copying is like, okay, I like Q-Tip's style. I'm going to try to make music like him. No, these dudes are straight jacking. Like, give me that beat, and I'm putting my name on it. I might give you $500. I know a producer that I heard this story from from a very reliable source, guy to have him. Big producer. If I said his name, you guys would pass out. That was getting thirty thousand a track in like the mid nineties, which was an awful lot of money for me. It's still an awful lot of money, but in the mid nineties, that was a that was a chunk of money, thirty thousand a track. So he would get producers together you know, make beats. He picks something. I'll give you a G. He'll give you a thousand dollars for a beat. That's nice. You live in the projects or something. I'll give you a G. That's dope. I'll take the G. He takes that same beat, walks over here and presents it to somebody else and they give him 30,000 for it. So he made 29K in that transaction saying the beat was his. Now, you who did the beat, who live in the projects, you couldn't walk into Def Jam. You couldn't even get past reception. So this beat could never even get in the door. This guy could walk the beat in the door, but he, it has to go through him. So he'll give you a G and he'll make 30, 29. So it's good for him. He's happy. He made 29,000. You're happy with your G. Everybody's happy until the record becomes a hit and you see how much it really generated. Then it, you, you're heartbroken.
when everybody's praising this producer, when you're home and you're watching the Grammys and this guy is record of the year and he's holding up record of the, the Grammy with your beat on it. All right. We, I've, I've been going, all right, y'all, I'm getting out of here. That, that was my last. I, like I said, I could talk about this for a long time. Y'all, I'm sorry if I went long on this. Next Tuesday, y'all, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much for you guys checking in, and I will catch you guys next week. Love. <laughs>